Hey, Refinery Church, this is Pastor Brad from the West McKinley campus. Glad you could join us tonight as we continue our Bible study as we have been looking at things to come. We looked in the first couple of weeks about uh, the second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, um, the tribulation period. Tonight, we're going to wrap up our series as we look at the Antichrist. And so we're glad that you could join us tonight. Uh, we're going to wrap up this series tonight. So I, uh, hopefully this has been beneficial to you over the last couple of weeks. I will let you know what we're going to be doing in the following weeks so over the next couple of days. So pay attention to Facebook and YouTube and the uh, webpage. We'll get that information out to you. Sunday was a great day. It was a little different. Um, not having all of you there. Uh, we had uh, all of our campuses open Sunday. It was good to see some of you. And uh, hopefully over the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll see more of you. I totally understand some of you staying home, some of you uh, having con some concerns, and uh, we would rather you stay home until you feel comfortable coming back. But we do miss you. Um, hopefully we'll see you in the next uh, couple of weeks. So anyway, we're going to be looking at the Antichrist tonight. Uh, uh, it's kind of an interesting deal as you look at our culture and the world. There's, there's a real um, sense of um, wanting to know who's the Antichrist, when he's coming to power. I mean, you look at movies and, and uh, you know, through the years, The Omen and um, uh, Omega Code and The Devil's Advocate and uh, books like Back From My Day and Age, books like The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, um, um, Left Behind, uh, the Tim LaHaye series. And so there's this real kind of what's going to happen? What are the things to come? And that's why we've been doing this series. And, and, and wanting to know who the antichrist is a is um, on people's minds they just want to know who he is there's a fascination uh, for lack of a better term there's a fascination with the antichrist who is he what will he do the interesting thing is that the antichrist has already come what do you mean by that pastor well look in first john if you go to first john um, hopefully you have your bibles with you tonight 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Let me read it to you. This is what it says. It says, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, uh, but uh, they never really belonged to us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us when they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. This happens in churches. People come, uh, people go. But believe it or not, there are situations where um, Antichrist, people who are against Christ, will infiltrate the church. The scriptures talk about being be careful about wolves that are out there. And that happens. Um, it happens sometimes where somebody comes into the church and, and the enemy uses them for division in a church. Those are Antichrists. Um, now, what we're going to look at tonight is the Antichrist, but Scripture is clear. There are, there are people who have already come uh, in these days, in the, in the days since Christ, who are Antichrist. And so we need to understand that. John says that there, there are those who, who deny Christ. If you deny Christ, you're Antichrist. You understand that? That's what he's saying. First John chapter 2, look, verse 22, he says this, And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an anti-Christ. So I'm not saying, we're not saying that somebody that maybe comes into a church and, and who loves Jesus but leaves and, and goes somewhere else or, or whatever is an anti-Christ. No, 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 no. But there are people in the world who are anti-Christ. We see the agenda of the enemy. The agenda's enemy is to destroy the church to divide the church. So the enemy will send antichrists into the church. The enemy will send the spirit of antichrist is in the world and he'll try to divide, he's antichrist. First John chapter four, verse three says this, but if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. 
So the spirit uh, is this, this spirit of antichrist is the spirit of, of, of the enemy. It's the spirit of Satan. And this spirit is, we know this, this spirit is already in the world today. It's already there. This is the, the spirit of Antichrist. And yes, it's active right here. It's active right here in the United States of America. This isn't something that's, that's only active in other parts of the world. It's active in the United States of America. So today we want to look at not just the spirit of Antichrist, but we want to look at what the scriptures teach us about who the person, the Antichrist, that was who we normally talk about, who the person of the Antichrist is. Who is he? Who is this person going to be? The Antichrist is going to appear, as we talked about the tribulation period a couple of weeks ago, the Antichrist is going to come into power. He's going to appear during the tribulation period. The rapture of the church has happened, okay? The, the believers have been taken out of the way. Then the Antichrist will rise up in power and establish rule on the earth. This individual will become a, a world leader. Uh, in fact, the world's going to come under him. Uh, he'll, he'll rule the world. It'll be, be one government, one system, one religious system in the world. So who is he? Where does he come from? Uh, what will he do? What will he be like? Well, let me walk you through some scriptures. And again, this is going to be kind of, you know, drinking from a fire hydrant uh, tonight. But uh, let me walk you through some scriptures that give us a glimpse of who he is and what he will be like. The first thing we see is, I want to talk about is who is the Antichrist? Well, let me, I'm going to tell you who the Antichrist is. We don't know. We don't know who he is. Uh, we know things about him. We know what he'll be like, but we don't know him. Uh, we do know that he'll be non-Jewish. He'll be a Gentile. Um, in the scriptures, it talks about him coming up out of the sea. Now, now in, in scriptural uh, interpretation, when it talks about that, that's talking about coming out of not the Jewish nation, but coming out of the Gentile nation, um, that, that he's going to come up out of the sea. Um, so we know he's going to be a Gentile. He's not going to be a Jew. Okay, He's not going to be Jewish. He's going to be a Gentile. Where he's going to come from, we don't know exactly. Okay, But that's, that's the thought of what he'll be. Um, the scripture says... The dragon will give him his power. In fact, go get into Revelation with me. Revelation chapter 13. Let me give you a couple of scriptures as we walk through this. Revelation 13 verse 2 says this. The beast looked up. Uh, excuse me. Let's try that again. The beast looked like a leopard, but he had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. The beast gave the dragon uh, his power. Um, the dragon really is, uh, let's be honest, there's no such thing as, as a dragon. Uh, a dragon though, if you think about it, if you go back to, to, to when uh, John wrote this revelation, when God gave John this revelation, Rome used the symbol of a dragon. Rome used that symbol as a dragon. The dragon, uh, um, the dragon was, um, actually one of the principal standards for Rome, uh, for the Roman Empire. Next to the eagle, they used the eagle and a dragon. Um, in the second and third and fourth and fifth centuries of Christian era, the dragon was, was representative of Rome. All right? So it's symbolic. It's, what is it symbolic of? The dragon is symbolic of power and authority. So in John's day, the writers, or excuse me, the readers would have fully understand what uh, was being said. The dragon, we know from reading scripture, is representative of Satan. Uh, the beast is the Antichrist. So the dragon gives power to the Antichrist. So how, what does it say? The, the Antichrist will be empowered by Satan himself. That's where his power is going to come from. Uh, he will ha uh, come to power through political and through military might. That's what the scripture tells us. In fact, uh, back in the book of Daniel, Sunday we talked about Daniel. We talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel is rich in prophecy concerning um, the, the, the uh, end times, things to come. Uh, Daniel chapter 11 says this. Look at it with me. 11 verses 21 and 22. This is what it says. 
Uh, the next to come to power will be a despicable man who is not in line for Lord, royal succession. He will slip in when least expected and take over the kingdom by flattery and intrigue. So by political means, he'll come to power. He will be, uh, uh, begin in obscurity and quickly, the scripture says, he will devour the nations. Quickly, he'll come to power. If you go to chapter seven of Daniel, verses seven and eight, he says this. Then in my uh, vision that night, I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, and very strong. It devoured the, and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth. It trampled their uh, remnants beneath its feet. It was different from any of the other beasts, and it had 10 horns. As I looked, excuse me, as I was looking at the horn, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for it. This little horn had eyes like, a, like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. Then if you go to verse 24, it says this, it's 10 horns then uh, are 10 kings who will rule the empire. Then another king will rise different from the other 10 who will subdue three of them. The 10 horns represent 10 nations or 10 federations. Uh, these are different. Um, uh, these are different. Uh, there's, let me back. There's different opinions on what nations these are, and I don't think we need to, to try to get into that. The thought is that this federation has worldwide influence. Look at our look at our world today. Something that happens in one nation, how it affects someone else. This whole pandemic thing. You know, we had situation going on in China and how that affected us. We had our medical. We've, we discovered that, that most of our medicines come out of China, how that, that affects us. And so, so this, this federation will have worldwide influence. Through that federation, that worldwide influence, they have worldwide power. It, it's so interesting to me to watch how one small little nation, one little nation that, that produces some maybe uh, fuel or, or oil or whatever, how when that one little nation has an issue, how it affects everything. And that's where the world we're in today. We're in that this is little tiny nation can affect worldwide, it have worldwide influence. So there's this influence, but the Antichrist will, cons will quickly consume three of these federations or three of these nations. Much like Rome, Rome spread out and had worldwide power in Jesus' day. This, this, this Antichrist will have worldwide power. He'll have worldwide power. He'll raise. Uh, he'll raise from the dead. The scriptures tell us. Okay, um, or at least let me back up. At least appear to have raised from the dead. Uh, Revelation thirteen three says this. I saw that one. Uh, that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery. So that gives you the sense of it appears that he died, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marvelled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. This is um, a physical wound, um, a political wound, we don't know. But what he's saying is, what the writer is saying is, it appears that there was some wound that occurred, whether it's physical, political, whatever, maybe maybe it's somebody that had risen to, to political power and then that had been shamed and pushed out to where it seemed like their, their, their political aspirations were dead and now they've raised back up, whether it's a, a physical wound, it appears that they physically had died and now are, are back to life. We don't, we don't really know. We can speculate, we can talk, we can debate about it, uh, but we, let's be honest, we really don't know. Okay, so this physical wound, this political wound, whatever, we don't know what it is, seems to have been miraculously resurrected like a miraculous resurrection. Um, is the Antichrist alive today? It's possible he is. We don't know. Uh, it's possible, but we don't know. I mean, if, if, if the rapture of the church happens in, before tomorrow, before you're done watching this, yeah, obviously he's alive today. If it doesn't happen for a thousand years, no, he's not. 
We don't know. Again, we don't know when Christ is going to come for the church. We don't know when the tribulation period is going to start. When we look around, it seems like it's ready to happen. It seems like our world's ready to explode. It seems like like it's it, it's prime for um, Jesus' return, but we don't know that. Um, I know enough about history. I'm not a history buff by any stretch of the imagination. I know enough about history to know there's been other times in history where things look like the Lord's going to come back today. And then he didn't. The Lord's going to come back today. And he didn't. We look today and say, the Lord's ready to come back today. And I hope he does. But he may not. But we just need to be ready. We know we're in the last days because anything from the time of Christ, his resurrection, him going back to heaven till now and beyond are the last days. That much we do know. And we do know that he's coming back for us. The second thing we want to look at is, okay, we don't know who he is. We know he's a Gentile. We know he's going to have a wound that appear to appear, uh, 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 appears to have, uh, have healed. Um, but, so what is he going to do? What is, what is the Antichrist going to do? Well, basically he's going to have all the answers to the world's problems. Think that through. Wouldn't it be great if we had a leader that had all the answers? We're going through a really rough time in America. We've got the pandemic situation. We have racial tensions that are happening. We have all this stuff going on. Wouldn't it be great if somebody stepped up with the answers? Well, you and I know as believers that Jesus has all the answers. But the Antichrist is going to step up, in my opinion, my thoughts, after the rapture of the church and say, I have the answers. I have all the answers. He'll set up a world economy. The trade will happen. The world economy. Look at uh, Revelation. Go to Revelation 13. Look what it says. Verses 16 through 18 says this. He required everyone, small and great, rich, poor, free, slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Verse 18, wisdom is, uh, is needed here, that the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. We've heard that all right. Some hotels won't have a room, 666. We've heard that for years. This is a part of the world economic system that the Antichrist will set up. Uh, um, we have this technology to do this today. It's happening. I saw a, a, a news clip the other day of a, of a guy who implanted a chip uh, in his hand and he was like opening his car. He could, uh, like you can take your your, your smartphones and, and you, can, you can just tap them on the... Uh, uh, on the cash register thing, it's not a cash register, I can't think of what it's called right now. But you just tap it on there and it'll, it'll transfer money for you. So the technology is there. So when we talk about, um, are we getting close to the rapture of the church? When we see that kind of stuff, it's like, man, it's, it's right there. Um, this, honestly, with the chaos in the world, this will make perfect sense. Because we, the, the, the thought's going to be, we need to have some order. Here's a way to keep order. Well, you can steal this. You can steal my credit card, but you can't steal, a, it, well, you, I suppose you could, but it'd be more difficult to, to steal a chip out of my hand or out of my forehead. Much more difficult to do that. And by the way, you don't forget it at home. Could you imagine walking to the store and it registers that you're there? Leaving, you just put your hand down. So from a from a economical standpoint, from a logistical standpoint, it makes it makes sense. Um, it makes sense. I'm not saying we should do that by any the scripture says don't take this mark. Obviously, don't do that. If you know people who, who aren't believers, make sure they understand, Lord, or that that if the, the Lord comes back and you're gone, don't do this. Okay? This will this mark, this, this way of encoding or whatever you want to call it, will, will give him 
absolute power of the world system. It said nobody can buy or sell or trade. Absolute control. He will establish a one world religion. Not just economic. This isn't just economic. He's going to establish a one world religion. Revelation, go to Revelation 13, 5 through 15. That's what it says. It's a little bit longer passage. Let me read it to you. Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God. And he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. He spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name uh, and his temple. That is those who live in heaven. The beast was allotted to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all the people who belonged to this world worshiped the beast. Verse 11, then I saw another beast come, de- come up out of the earth who had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast, those uh, whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astonishing miracles, even making uh, fire flash down to the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to the world. He ordered the people to make uh, a great statue of the first beast whose fatal wound, who, who was fatally wounded, then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to his statue so that it could speak. And the statue of the beast commanded that everyone refusing to worship it must die. Pretty tough stuff. Um, this second horned beast is what we call the, the what is scripture calls the false prophet, uh, the religious leader of the Antichrist religious system. So you have the Antichrist and you have the, the false prophet. Um, it's interesting as you look at this, Satan is such a deceiver. And even in this, Satan is mimicking, he's trying to mirror the image of God. Now, if you go back in the Old Testament, the reason that Satan got cast out of heaven is because he wanted to sit where God sat. He wanted to be God. So in this system of the Antichrist, in this system of Satan's trying to take over the world, we see him mimicking God. You have God in the Trinity, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Satan's kingdom, you have Satan, you have the Antichrist, and you have the false prophet. So you see the mirror there. The Antichrist is going to set himself up as God. See, Satan thinks through this, he'll be able to be God. He's even deceived himself. So he sets himself, the Antichrist will set himself up as God. In other words, you're going to, people, the world's going to come and worship the Antichrist. Second Thessalonians, back in the New Testament, chapter 2, verses four, verse 4 says this, He will oppress and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself, proclaiming himself to be God. He's going to set himself up as God. And all the earth is going to worship him. Those who don't worship him will be put to death. The third thing is, what's Jesus' response to all of this? Well, Jesus' response is, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Revelation 14, 14 through 16 says this. Then I saw a white cloud and seated on the cloud was someone like uh, the Son of Man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the, on the cloud, swing the sick, sickle, the time of harvest has come. The crop on earth is ripe. So that the one sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the whole earth was harvested. When Jesus comes at the end of the, the tribulation period, when he comes at the second coming, when he, when he comes there at the end of the tribulation period, he will cut down the beast 
He will cut down the Antichrist. He will cut down the false prophets and those who chose to follow him. Do I need to worry about the Antichrist? Absolutely not. No. Do I need to worry when I see the world moving towards one economic system? Absolutely not. Well, why not, Pastor? Isn't that, isn't that terrifying? Absolutely not. You know what that tells me? We're that much closer to the coming of Jesus. Actually, it should excite us. We shouldn't be fearful. We're believers. We know where we're going to be. We're going to spend eternity with heaven, in heaven with God. It should excite us. The Antichrist will, will have power. He will have worldly authority. But he's a fake. He's a fake. He is a fake Messiah. Jesus wants us ready before he sets up his kingdom. He wants us ready to go with him in the rapture. So the question is, are you ready? These are the things to come. We need to be ready. Pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the truth of the scriptures. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody that's watching today, who's watching this, that doesn't know you, that they'll come to a place where they say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, come and live in my life. So that when that day comes and the trumpet sounds, that they'll go to be with you, with us, to meet you in the air. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I go, don't forget, uh, this Sunday, we're having live in-person gathering again. Uh, if you would make sure to go online and tell us what service, if you're planning on coming, what service you're planning on coming to, that's just simply to give us kind of a, an idea of how many will be here. Uh, if we get to maximum capacity, which would be 100 um, in both services, then that gives us the opportunity to say, we'll, we'll put in a third service to make sure that everybody who wants to come can come. So if you continue to pray, continue to pray that, that, that when we get to the end of this, this couple of week period, um, that they'll, we'll be in a place where we can have all the restrictions uh, uh, lifted and that we can get back to uh, life as normal. God bless you. Have a great, great evening.